So we just mentioned that if you know that the partial derivatives of the function exist, it doesn't necessarily mean that the function is differentiable at that point. However, a partial converse to the theorem we proved before, and by the way, partial converse means that if you state a theorem A implies B, the, the converse would be that B implies A as well, but a partial converse says that B plus some additional assumption implies A. So we'll give a partial converse to the theorem we proved before that says if a function is differentiable, then its partial derivatives exist. So this theorem, the proof of which I think is really cool, um, is if you have a function that's differentiable on, let's say, an open domain from Rn to Rm, so A is an open domain in Rn, and C is some point in A, Um, if, in addition, we have first, um, there exists an open set U, an open set U and Rn, such that C is in U, and two, if the partial derivatives of f exist and are continuous on u. So the partial derivatives define functions on u. So that should be a little, we should be sure that we understand why. Um, if we know that the partial derivatives exist, then we can vary the point x and as we vary the point, it makes sense to talk, to ask whether these functions are continuous. Then, f is differentiable at c. And by the previous theorem, we know that if f is differentiable, then its derivative differential at c is expressed in terms of the partial derivatives of the function f. So for the proof, as we already know, if we want to construct a candidate for the differential, we should take its partial derivatives and put it into a matrix form. The only remaining thing in order for us to prove this theorem is to show the goal of proving this theorem is to prove that the limit as h approaches 0 of f of c plus h minus f of c minus this, this differential doesn't make sense, but we have a candidate for what it is in terms of the matrix that we had before. So that's what I mean when I write this. DCF applied to H. If this quotient equals 0. And it'll turn out that we will use in a crucial way the fact that the partial derivatives not only exist, which we know is not enough, but are continuous on some open domain containing the point C. So we will take this expression and we will rewrite it in a different way by using the mean value theorem multiple multiple times. So what exactly do I mean by that? So pick any point C. Let's start with one color and then we'll change colors as we go on. Let's, let's pick the point C, and because C is in an open domain, I know that there's some rectangle that contains C, and that rectangle is also contained in, in A. So let's first look at the, the axis going through C in one direction. As we go in this one direction, we have this rectangle that's contained in our set A, so we know that this rectangle, part of this rectangle, it has a side that goes from C to C plus, let's say, let's call it, um, let's call it H1 in the ith direction, in the first direction. So this is the point C plus H1 times the vector E1. And what we have here is we can restrict our function to be a function on the interval c 
to C plus H1. Well, C1 rather. So restrict the function f to the interval. C1 comma C1 plus H1. And what I mean by that is again, we have this line inside of some rectangle. I haven't drawn the full rectangle yet. Maybe I, I'll do that just so you see what I'm talking about. So here we have some rectangle. And we're only looking at one of the sides of this rectangle. Well, we're only looking at one of the um, pieces of this rectangle. So we have some rectangle like this. And here the point C is in the back. This is poorly drawn. Um, and so we look at this point, and we look at the function restricted to this line, and this defines a function, a function valued in Rm, defined on this line. And if we just set m equals to 1, just for convenience, we can, uh, we can always change this argument because we know that such a function is differentiable if and only if each of its component functions are differentiable. It suffices to focus on just one of those functions. So set m equals to 1 just for simplicity, and I'll leave you to check what happens to the proof if you make m arbitrary. So if you restrict f to this interval, then by assumption, this function is differentiable in a slightly larger neighborhood even outside this domain because we, f we know that this rectangle is contained inside of A. And so by the mean value theorem, for, uh, for uh, functions of a single variable, we can look at the difference. We know that there exists some point. This point's very important. There exists some point and let's call this point Q1. So there's some point Q1. And to not be too confusing, let me, because this is a point in Rn, let me put a vector over it just to be very, very clear that this is not the, ith com this is not the first component of some vector. This is literally a vector. So there exists some Q1 in Rn such that if I call this point P1, let's say, and if I call C P0, then F of P1 minus F of P0, so this is the difference of the function at these two endpoints when we're thinking of functions of a single variable, is equal to since we have a function of a single variable, the mean value theorem tells us that the difference of the function on two endpoints of the interval is equal to the derivative of the function at some intermediary point times the distance between those two endpoints. So this is equal to, and the distance here is h1, h1 times and since we're dealing with functions of a single variable, that corresponds to the partial derivative of f here. So this is the first partial derivative of f evaluated at that point q1. And we can use this idea by going consistently in every single direction. So after we've done this for the first direction, we can now look at the new point P1 and then we can go along this line and again we have some rectangle contained in our set so we can add this is going to be C plus H1 E1 we've gone up to this point already and then we go to the next point and the next point is plus H2 E2 and let's call this P2 now if we restrict our function to this new interval we can apply the mean value theorem again, and we'll find another point, Q2. Again, such that f of P2 this time, so we'll have f of P2 
P2 minus F of P1 is equal to, this time the distance, the displacement along the interval is H2, so we have H2 times, and we're going in the second direction. So this is the partial derivative of F in the second direction, evaluated at the point Q2. And we keep doing this all the way up until M. There's nothing that prevents us from doing this. And so let me draw, for instance, the third one, but without writing the formula down, here is going to be P3, and there's going to be some Q3 here. So here's where something pretty amazing happens. Notice that f of c plus h, so h, these hi's are exactly the components of h, by the way. Um, then c plus h is exactly the opposite corner of this rectangle. So c plus h is precisely pn. And so we have f of c plus h minus f of c is equal to f of pn minus f of p0. We can actually rewrite this as pn and then add a bunch of zeros. f of pn minus 1 and subtract f of pn minus 1. And we're going to keep doing this all the way up, all the way down, until we get f of p1 minus f of p1 plus minus f of p0. And really what I should have done is I should have written the minus sign here and the plus sign here so that it's easier to see what we're doing. So let me actually do that right now by erasing this and adding the plus here, erasing this and adding the plus here. So now, let's look at every other term, so every even term. So the, here, this is exactly this. And if we look at the next two terms going backwards, then this next term is this. Then this equals the sum of taking all of these differences, so it's going to be f of e i minus f of p i minus 1, where i goes from, let's see, 1 all the way up until n. That's what this expression equals. But we know exactly what this is by the mean value theorem that we used here. And this, all we have to do is sum up all of these derivative terms. So what we get here is h i times the partial derivative of f in the ith direction evaluated at the points qi. Kind of cool, right? So now you have h is appearing here as a linear factor, and these are just some numbers. So what happens when you plug this expression in into this quotient? Well, if you take this term now, and write what that equals in terms of the partial derivatives. Remember, we have a guess for what the matrix should be. This is dfh equals the sum. This is, in ter this is written in terms of the partial derivatives. This is the partial derivatives. This is hi times the partial derivatives of f evaluated at which point? C. So now we have an expression for both of these in terms of this kind of sum. They look very similar. The only difference is the input that we have for the partial derivatives. So if I write out what this quotient is, so let me denote, for instance, this quotient by, let's just take this thing and call this star, then star equals these two sums can be taken out. The h's are common, so we have hi as a common factor, and then we just have the difference of these two partial derivatives. So we have partial derivative of, so the first one is the q, so that's df 
evaluated at q i minus partial derivative of f evaluated at c. And if I included, maybe, you know, we might as well include the denominator factor here. So let me just call this entire left-hand term, left side by star. Then we have that this h factors through here. And we have this expression for every h, as long as this expression makes sense. And this makes sense for any sufficiently small h so that this cube, this rectangle, is inside of our open set. Now, here's where the continuity of the partial derivatives comes in. If I want to take this limit as h approaches 0, what happens to this first term? This first term is bounded by 1. And the reason it's bounded by 1 is because hi is always less than or equal to h. That's just the Pythagorean theorem. And we also know that it's never 0 because we're assuming that h is something positive at all times. And this term here, well, as h is getting small, what's happening to q? If I, if I go back to this picture, q is always positioned between the endpoints of this interval. And the interval is of length, each of these lit intervals is of length hi. So we know that q is approaching c as h approaches 0. And because the partial derivatives are assumed to be continuous, the limit of this expression here as h goes to 0 is this expression here. And so we have, so when we apply the limit and the algebraic limit theorem, the limit of this is bounded and the limit of this expression tends to 0. And if we have two such functions, one of which whose limit approaches 0 and the other one it's bounded, then the limit of the entire expression tends to 0 as well. And that's actually the proof of the theorem. So it's kind of a really cool application of the mean value theorem that we learned last semester applied to the situation of functions of several variables and sufficient conditions under which they are differentiable. We can take this now as a definition of a certain class of functions. It turns out that not all functions satisfy, not all differentiable functions satisfy these conditions. So the converse of this theorem isn't true either. And if a function satisfies these two conditions, if f satisfies these two conditions, then f is said to be of class C1. Equivalently, or another way to say it is that f is a continuously differentiable function. And continuously differentiable functions are very different from just differentiable functions. One does not imply the other. Uh, continuously differentiable functions are always differentiable, but differentiable functions are not always continuously differentiable. And we already know this from the case of a single variable. The topologist sine curve is an example of a function that's differentiable but not continuously differentiable. And it turns out that when you have several variables, even more simpler functions than strange functions like the topology sine curve are also um, differentiable but not necessarily continuously differentiable. For example, you can check that the function taking the absolute value, rather the, um, yeah, the absolute value of x times y is a differentiable function but it's not continuously differentiable. So I'll leave that to you to check as an exercise.